Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We meet here every month and you're invited to the meetings uh, of the LA. Uh, this month it's Bob Layson and he'll be talking on Is Macroeconomics a Justificationist uh, Theory for State Interventionism? Catchy, though. <laughs> yes, thank you, David. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we do dry runs, uh, very dry runs sometimes, of these talks in Stevenage. Uh, they're more of a sort of cheap recording session with friends as an audience, but still, we do them. And um, one of them recently was, was going to be by me, and it gets into the local paper. It's had one person turn up once. Huh? Anyway, it was going to be the concept of aggregate demand. And someone said, isn't, isn't aggregate something hard and dry? Oh, that goes <laughs> that goes in the concrete. That is, yes. I mean, mm, I think you're right. So it, it became uh, as as a uh, macroeconomics become the ideology of the inter, of the interventionist state, which is hey, less snappy but more more accurate. And um, in a way, yes, is the answer. Uh, <laughs> Next talk will be longer. <laughs> and now, uh, some reasons. Um, to, to start with, Adam Smith and others were arguing against the need for bounties on exports and tariffs on imports and um, various other things to help the economy and they quite rightly pointed out that on balances would do no such thing. In fact, worrying about the balance was pointless <laughs> as well uh, in, uh, in trade. These things look after themselves. Um, that's true. And because they were arguing against policies of various uh, governments, of various national governments, uh, they had to say um, that's the wrong policy. Uh, free trade or would be the, the right policy. And, um, and in other areas, of course, they argued the same way. And so they were already trapped, but of necessity, talking about national policy, and they were talking to national governments. And um, if they wanted to be scientific about this, they tried as far as they could, which wasn't very much, to um, get some figures in about what's going in, what's coming out, who's, who's spending this and that. Not, not much of that, it must be said in the early days, but they did speak about national policy because, after all, that's where the policy came from. If there was a tariff, it came from the national government. If there was a subsidy, it came from the national government. So they turned to them and say, um, don't have that policy, have this policy. Um, this was then later backed up by uh, national statistics and, uh, and the rest, or estimates, because it was thought that to be a proper science, economics had to have figures in there somewhere. Although it actually doesn't require it in the slightest, just as um, it isn't necessary for any one producer or anybody at all, for that matter, to know how much electricity is being consumed by the population living under a certain dictatorial regime or government. As we call it. Oh, sorry, a democratic government. Um, it, it isn't necessary for anyone to know how much electricity is being produced. I mean, someone might want to know, but there's no reason for anybody to know. Certainly not the producers of electricity. They don't have to know. If they're um, in competition with each other, and if anyone can start up, they say, well, we're doing okay, and he seems to, he seems to be making it pretty cheap. And um, in, in Hong Kong, I believe, uh, civil servants there, in the good old days of the 50s and early 60s, uh, they said, they were asked about electricity supply. And they went, well, we don't really know who produces it. We, don't, we haven't bothered to find out, really. It's, uh, people want it, someone supplies it, it's paid for. What? The idea that someone has to know and then use that for an argument or, or something or a plea for a plea for a subsidy or something else. That in the same way, each supplier does not need to know uh, the output of every other supplier. They might be very sharp and seeing how their rivals are doing and the methods they're using and the prices they're charging and the quality of their output. But beyond that, all you have to know is this is the going rate can I undercut it, or can I sell for the same price something that the customers will like more? That's how it works. 
That's how a market order works. So they may have their statistics of sales. Each, you know, each, each commercial producer sees what their sales are, they've got to sell them. And the rest of it. So I mean, no, one, no one needs to know the total. However, thanks to um, central banking, and people who are complete central bankers, uh, the economy occasionally to topples in to a recession or a depression or a rolling recession or a great depression. And this is thought to be unconstrained capitalism lurching about, you know, taking both sides of the road, getting a speed wobble or falling into a ditch. This is just, it, it's, it's inherent. It's going to happen. Now, of course, thanks to Mises and others since, we uh, have reason to believe that um, recessions come of credit booms and booms lead to busts. Uh, I think they jolly well do. We, could, we needn't touch that again. No, we can, we can later in the question period if you want to know more about it. So the idea has got about, partly through critics, of course, of the, the market order, that it's, uh, it's likely to uh, tumble into a ditch. And then government is required to haul it out again. Now, they didn't much think this in the 19th century because they didn't quite realise where the recessions came from. I think they had a bit of a clue, even then, that it was, a, it was a credit expansion, it was banking that was doing it. However, the idea now is that unconstrained capitalism produces a problem and its government has to solve the problem. That's, that's been the idea for many, uh, many decades since. Uh, well, quickly through how to make a recession, uh, credit expansion, artificial lowering of the, well, actually, in fact, you can only lower the interest rate at which people can borrow by creating credit, which is done by the central bank and the banking system. And you know what? So the interest rates are lower, so projects that should not be started are started, and eventually the whole thing cannot cohere. Now, along with uh, national policy, there, of course, there is national currency. There need not have been, as we know, uh, national currency should be like um, uh, five-inch nails or fuse wire or something. It, anyone can make it, and some make it cheaper than others. They do quite well, but again, you need to know how much there is in the world, rather as with electricity production. So it's not necessary to know how much currency there is currently current. And there isn't, all, all one needs to know is that the currency that someone has offered one is a certain a certain commodity of a certain quality and a certain weight. Anyone can make it, rather like bootlaces. There's no government need to produce bootlaces. There's no government need to produce gold currency. That looks after itself in a way by people insisting on receiving what they expected to receive by way of, of payment. So there's no re reason for government to get involved. But of course, since the king wanted, <laughs> king wanted to um, repay his debts in in money, which is a bit smaller and not quite as golden as it was before. And, you know, uh, do you want to argue? My courts will, well, my judges will, you know, okay, no, no, no one wants to argue. So, of course, we had currency that became smaller and smaller, or, and eventually the Victorians, you know, before them, uh, saw the way out of that one. And for a while, there was a world currency. Now, there might be different, Rothbard's quite good on this. There might be different weights of the material, and they might have different names, but in effect, there was no exchange rate. It's like saying the exchange rate between two and four. <laughs> well, it takes two twos to make one four. Well, in the same way, a certain mass, if it's a certain ratio compared to another mass, well, that will be the, it's not really an exchange rate, it's just a way of paying, isn't it? You're just paying more coins or fewer coins. That's, that's how it will work out. So there was no need for the government to worry about gold leaving the country or the exchange rate or anything else. As AJP Taylor says somewhere, an Edwardian gentleman could, without a passport, could get into his balloon. He did in those days. 
<laughs> prevailing winds would take them somewhere, uh, somewhere in Europe, and they would they would land and they would uh, repair the local tavern. And they were paying um, gold coin while they hired someone to put the balloon onto onto a train to get it back again. Um, uh, no need for a passport, of course. No, no, why should you have a passport? Passports, I understand, and I insist, and I've never bothered to check. <laughs> uh, passports for or for diplomats. So when a war was declared, they could leave the country. They, were, they could show their passport and they were allowed out. Well, they might be encouraged out, but the point is they should not be hindered or hurt or... That was no one else had to have a passport, for goodness sakes. Of course not. You were just someone travelling. What's the problem? Anyway, what else was a government or, or a nation becoming? We have a national currency and then uh, national tariffs or arguing about narrow, national tariffs or having the right to impose tariffs because you just do because you're a government looking after the welfare of people. Uh, we know how to make recessions for the central banking system and then blame it on the market. Uh, so eventually we end up, and then of course there's, you know, by this time there is encouragement of trade unions which ought to exist but not their um, violent or coercive behaviour. Um, and also there were labour exchanges starting to arrive after 1900 and um, some wage councils and things, various, various things um, designed, no, not designed to cause mass unemployment, but necessary conditions of um, eventual mass unemployment. So having made a recession by credit expansion, we now have welfare payments that you give to people to keep them looking for work and never finding it because they're looking for work at the the going rate, the going rate is the one that keeps them unemployed, pretty much because it is the union rate. It doesn't have to be like that. So it's now thought that, um, well, later on it was thought stupidly that, well, not stupidly, because at that time the gold standard had gone and people and governments were inflating and therefore it had to be decided what was the cause of rising prices. Was it too much money chasing too few goods? And, uh, those of us old enough can remember all this. But, the reason there was more money is because some bum had made it. There was a lot more of it about. There was a lot more being spent, and it can't be spent unless it's created. And who created it? Well, that was the uh, the government and or the banking system, which is, again, the government's, uh, government's fault. However, since having made recessions, um, there's unemployment. That's unemployment sometimes. And it has to be regarded almost like a, a communicable disease. You have, it just strikes, boom, there's just done, it's just that, what's going to happen? What can you do? So in the same way as there has to be in the NHS to deal with things, communicable diseases, or have to be um, uh, public sewers and uh, sanitary inspectors and other, other such things, all of which can be done privately and more effectively and cheaper. Um, so we have rather like the NHS, although the NHS came a bit later actually, but the idea was that there, there is a problem of employment. There just is a problem. There just can be. The idea that people are asking too much, respecting too much, or other regulations make, it, make, it, make them too expensive even at a lower wage, slightly lower wage, than they expect to get, uh, is put aside. It's thought that you simply have prolonged unemployment because or market failure, or inadequate demand, uh, aggregate demand that is. Now we know that um, given the, uh, the Miesian uh, banking and credit expansion and, well, I might as well give you my, my take on this which at least is different, which is that um, it's, it's possible to create money. I mean, it certainly is possible to create money. But you don't create a demand thereby. The money may go up in volume, but depending on what the prices are, of course, uh, demand has not increased. It's probably a bit too simple. Put it this way. It's possible to spend like a richer population than the population is. 
until the prices catch up, it's undoubtedly the case that those who have got these, these new loans can buy capital, can hire workers, can the unemployment rate might fall, the amount of fixed capital may increase. This, this can be done, but only because the prices have yet to catch up. When the prices do catch up, it's found that there is now, in a sense, a disproportionate ensemble of capital old and new, and it simply cannot make a profit. That's the way I like to put it, but that's just, that's just me. Okay. So now the um, ideology, let's, let's put it this way. By this time, it's, it's thought necessary to have government policies on currency, on the exchange rate, possibly, if you're off gold, on employment, on what to do with the Un the chronic unemployed, because it just strikes them. It's not their fault. It's there's just unemployment, like there's a like there is a disease. So what to do? Well, we have to have an activist government, of course. By this time, it is being activist. It's deciding, um, but it always was as regards the army and the navy, and now it's doing other things at local and national level uh, to provide things that would not, it's thought, wrongly, but otherwise not be provided at all. So really there's the kind of practice, let alone the fact that some socialists are arguing for this be the practice throughout, that there should simply be uh, the state um, controlling such matters, deciding such matters, or the people. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll decide. They'll decide by appointing people who couldn't possibly know what they were doing for reasons given by uh, Hayek and others that you simply you don't know what you should be make, making. Well, you know the range of goods that people would rather like to have, but as to the distribution of capital, physical capital, and human labor can't be known without the price system, without being able to see. Uh, I like to um, make this all very real and, and, and concrete, back to the aggregate, by, um, by explaining that the whole point with prices and people who have experience of prices, a good price, a poor price, bad price, being able to judge between your different goods, is that um, they, are, they allow one company to succeed with superior plans and other with inferior plans to fail. And so the great public, not by voting in elections, but just by being a good judge of the quality of items and the cheapness and saying, well, that's a bit much, and if I've done... But when millions are doing this, it, um, it allows businesses, the better ones, to succeed and the other ones to fail. And this is done in a way that um, straightforward voting for people to do that, deciding for you, could not do it. You have to have people, not just consumers, but producers too, deciding between inputs, deciding between producers of inputs, adopting various plans. However, by this time, Keynes and others and the socialists have, um, have been arguing the point that it has to be done consciously. You can't, you can't let, let, um, let the market decide. It's got to be done. And aside from which, what happens if the interest rates... No, no. What happens if the exchange rates can't be maintained? Which they can't be if the governments are debauching the currency. It's likely that... But then another, another currency that is not being debauched in such a rapid manner will rise in value compared to the, the local currency. So these things are, reg are regarded as somehow coming from outside, not due to government. It's something that the government is there to fight inflation, for example, and fight inequality, and fight unemployment by paying people to engage in it for prolonged periods. Rather strange. Uh, and then comes Keynes and explains that, um, well, you couldn't expect lazy, lazy theories, as someone once said, do you believe in lazy theories? I see one in the mirror every day. I certainly do. <laughs> so that was the view. Uh, it can't be left to them. The whole thing's going to go out of whack. And there has to be um, a conscious government policy to maintain uh, demand. 
So put with the idea that there had to be the currency looked after, the defence looked after, the safety looked after, you name it. This was just one more thing that government had to do to control demand. So this was very convenient. Now we get to the ideology bit. Um, most people are most people are genuine, I think, honest, um, if not truth telling. But they're very often not trying to be truth tellers, <laughs> and they're honest in that regard. But they may not have told the truth. So even hypocrites have genuine beliefs and explanations they sincerely <laughs> rely on to explain things. Um, ideology is supposed to be a, a bad thing, you know. He has an ideology. I have a worldview. All right. I have an explanation of that you can do it here, but she hasn't. Well, you could, I don't know. Who knows what she has? Muddled idea of the whole thing. I don't know. Um, so uh, an ideology is not necessarily a bad thing. The bad thing is refusing to argue, uh, dismissing evidence. And in itself, it is simply having beliefs about matters of fact in the past, present, and possibly the future. And explanations you think to be true, which seems to be a, not a bad thing, nothing to um, nothing to be upset about. You know, you are an ideologue. Uh, unless, of course, you're lying and defrauding and looking for confirmation, uh, which people do. Uh, I haven't read Susan Popper, of course. Um, they should be looking for, as with the global warming alarmism, but that's another lecture necessarily. Uh, there's not enough. You mean in, uh, January? Not enough self dis Oh, again. Uh, in January of that one. Oh, good. Good. Uh, so th there's not enough looking for um, disconfirmation. And so people are, uh, well, instead of dealing with your opponent's argument in a fair way, even if you think he's a lying bastard and a cheat, the, the thing is you, you take him at not his two face value, but, but the other one, and you deal with it as, as if it were all honest and truthful, and at least were truthful as far as he could tell. And um, however, as we see from the, uh, and America making a wonderful display of this, we are too, that um, instead of saying, ah, well, I can see given your, um, the, th the theories you use to explain things and what you believe to be previous conditions and present conditions, that you come to this conclusion. You might say that, and then you'll say, well, your theories are not adequate and your beliefs are erroneous, but I can see you're an honest man, or something. But now we simply say that someone is uh, malign and ignorant or stupid or, and there are, there are sadly, no, this is not unknown in human history, I'm sure, but it's far easier to do it without that fear of being asked to go outside um, on the internet. You can, you can simply dismiss people as um, uh, stupid and ill or greedy. Uh, so uh, people are looking for confirmation and not doing the pop Popperian thing and looking for, in their own case and other people, look, looking for contradiction and uh, arguments against. Um, I've touched upon the uh, commercial production as being a discovery process. Uh, no a priori reasoning, well, except arithmetic, which I suppose is a priori, and mathematics is much used in the practice of finding a better practice if you're, if you're in commerce. Um, so that's a discovery process, rather like with science. However, so where does the ideology come, come in? I, I think most ideologies are uh, honest and unobjectionable, even when they're objectionable for being wrong, or stupidly put together, or plain bonkers, but you have, you can be polite and, uh, and even say such things. However, if you are telling governments to tax, borrow, command, forbid, um, and if you are a reporter who wants to be in the loop, if you are a commentator who doesn't want to be considered a complete outsider, 
then you have to um, regard the government as a great solver of problems. And a very good, well, indeed, since it's, since it's the best and the available, there can be no better way of solving a problem by turning it over to government. So the reason that uh, macroeconomics, especially with the idea that there must be a, a data, as they say in America, or data gathered, um, there must be information, there must be uh, people studying this stuff, the people must be pulling levers and uh, having computers r running through the night. Um, this is all necessary because we have to um, decide upon a, uh, a, a plan, a plan for dealing with all the aforementioned unemployment, inflation, recession, all things brought about by government. But if you're telling governments to tax more, but spend even more, and to borrow, or simply print the stuff as they do in Venezuela and elsewhere, um, then you remain in the loop as a reporter and a wise judge of events. And um, libertarians are, as the woman said, not even ignored. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Uh, I'd like to uh, think a little bit more about your opening line about nobody needs to know about oh, yes. the electricity supply. Uh, surely those who plan for sufficient supply would be looking to see the consumption. And if you're a capitalist, you'll have seize the opportunity to build reserve supply. Oh, is. certainly if you're a supplier, you want your customers to keep with you, and you can do that by actually supplying them with it. So um, there will be, as there were, I believe, local power stations in the early days. Um, the idea of a grid might occur to even rival producers because they could help each other out. So there's no reason why a, quote, national grid shouldn't, shouldn't arise uh, purely commercially. Although, for all we know, uh, local ways of doing might have been better. I don't know. Um, you can always move the fuel to the the place where it's being produced rather than, which is now, of course, partly the city fad with, um, with the wind turbines and such. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, certainly on, on the roof systems, they don't send it to the, don't send it to the national grid, they just consume it, consume it themselves. But um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that that's still the case that no one needs to know might be of interest to know what the world turnout of dumplings is, but uh, <laughs> it may not be vitally important to make use of that information in a productive way. Okay. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, recently I've been watching a few um, YouTube videos by uh, David Friedman, and he was trying to explain what he thought the difference between macroeconomics and microeconomics is and um, I'm not sure I got to the bottom of it or even that he did but um, he said because obviously price theory which is his specialism he says can be on the macro level you know, the wheat market the world wheat market that's not micro is it so so that can't quite be it um, and uh, best I could make out that he thought that it was macroeconomics <coughs> is some sort of large-scale disequilibrium. Uh, that, that's really, you, that's what you had to posit in order to do something distinctive. And, uh, but then of course he was very reticent because that was outside his area of specialism, which is price theory, uh, which is either most of or all of microeconomics, I'm not quite sure, according to David Freeman. Uh, well, I couldn't see how he could resist uh, the analysis of so-called disequilibrium on a large scale, because you, know, you can apply price theory to it, but for some reason he wanted to step back and say, no, no, I don't deal with that, I only deal with price theory. My father dealt with that. It's a different area of expertise, and he wouldn't touch it. That's an academic. He's allowed to have an amateur punt at it. He might 
you might do it rather well with it. I would have thought so. Yes. Uh, of course, on another occasion, I've spoken about Say's Law, and that um, I'll use the same remark again that macroeconomics misses the big picture because it's all that micro going on is, is macro. Yeah. And, um, but there are certain things that can make an unusual degree of uh, failure among all the little, some of the micro bits. But uh, that, that refers back, or I can refer back to the Austrian theory of the trade cycle. That's the reason one gets that, pretty much. There'll be a steady amount of, of um, redundancy and some industries rising, some industries, industries declining, there's going to be all kinds of that kind of, that kind of thing. But that's not, that's not the business cycle. Uh, it's other people's success. It's, I, I, I try to get it away from the idea that there's something national going on or, <laughs> or ought to be going on. There's simply stuff being made, transported and used somewhere else. And then money's sent back the other, in the other direction. Um, perhaps simultaneously, or for Austria hardly matters, with a... Uh, with digital money, it will, the money doesn't actually move, just the ownership is just transferred. transferred. Um, so I like to say that all the macro going on, well, the whole point with private ownership is you're not in someone else's way. Uh, you may have a rival, but you're not blocking anything. You're, it's your own little bit of land. Uh, private property is a way of keeping out of each other's way. That's, that's how it hangs together. And so d demand is, is all the other, is, every, is partly the remainder of people who aren't doing what you're doing. Otherwise, what, why would they demand what you're, you're making? So to examine it, possibly, or copy it or something. But for the most part, the makers of nuts and bolts don't make, you know, don't, yeah, they don't examine other people's, no, that's not true. They do examine other people's nuts and bolts. They may even try to examine their practices. They may try and learn, how, learn if they're, using certain techniques that they don't know. That's true. But again, that's still micro adjustments. Why is there a great, a great uh, wave of micro failure? Well, that is, the, that is the Austrian theory of the trade cycle. So that's how it comes about. Not, not that it needs to do, and not that there has to be a macro response. Like there's one thing, one bad thing happening, and then one other thing, state expenditure state borrowing has to solve that one thing. It's vitally important to realise that, I think most of us would see it that way, that unemployment is not something that strikes. There just are no jobs. I mean, the condition can be brought about that looks like that. That's certainly the case. But it does require regulation, taxation, unemployment benefit. When people talk about mass unemployment, I like to say, no, no, that's mass benefit recipiency. Look at that. Now, one of the necessary conditions for mass benefit recipiency is there being a benefit system. And, of course, people being alive, I suppose, as well. But that's a separate one. <laughs> it's the government that provides the, not the, not the life, it provides the, it provides the benefits to receive. But that becomes a necessary condition for mass unemployment. And then they say, it's the market failed. The market failed. No, 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 no. You provoked a recession and then froze it by saying, don't have to move, mate. Hang on, about. Don't have to drop your wages. That lowers demand anyway, so that's, that's, you shouldn't do that. Just, just wait and, and we'll spend a bit more somewhere else in the country and, and things will recover. And they usually do recover, but probably no thanks to the spending by the government. But the, the thing you're really incited to admit, when Bob gave a talk, the myth on unemployment, oh, yes. where he said that basically people were being employed by the state yes. to be under the Yes. Oh, well, that's, well, I can give that talk as well. That's true, yeah. that's true. Uh, not only that, but they're employed very, very usefully because <laughs> they're employed to show how the state is necessary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Oh, that? Oh, okay. An abomination. <laughs> a very old Before idea. The Lord, and, even, and even without the Lord. A very an old, a 19th century idea, by the by. Is it? Oh, yes. 
It's a very old idea, yeah. And it's very common in the 1930s when people did really worry, and they had more ground to worry since before or since, still now, about mass unemployment, because that was the big, the biggest percentage-wise mass mm. unemployment in the 1930s. So, uh, I, I suppose you might say that, that macroeconomics is really sort of, it's, it's, the, it's the bastard cousin or the bastard charm, I'm not quite sure which, of the broader idea of market failure, which is premised, I think, upon the idea that since markets are not perfect, therefore the state must intervene to address the imperfections. And one of the sets of imperfections that, that is identified the main set, but certainly one of them, is the idea that markets are prone to generating various pathologies in the literature, um, booms and slumps and so on and, and so forth. And, uh, 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 and therefore, because there are these imperfections, the state has to intervene. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and because there are lots of imperfections, because you can identify all sorts of things where markets are not perfect, therefore, uh, therefore you can justify lots of different interventions at all sorts of levels. And it, it's always seemed to me, obviously this really in a sense goes back to well before Hayek, but, but the idea that, that I find very persuasive is the fallacy in this, that you assume that because the, the market is not godlike in the sense that everything is perfect, therefore, the government is the right tool to deal with problems. Whereas what you should really be asking is, given the fact that the world is not perfect, what is better, leaving the market with its imperfections on the one hand, or using the state to intervene on the other hand? It's really a comparative exercise. When you do that exercise, you then get to the high question, which is, well, we know that there are various, we know that in order to address any problem, you have to have knowledge of what the problem is. Where does the knowledge come from? So you get back to Hayek, really. You get back to Hayek, which is, well, even if it is the case, and it is the case that markets are not perfect, that things go wrong, people make mistakes, and they can multiply errors, maybe made it, etc. What basis is there for thinking that officials and bureaucrats and so forth have the means and the knowledge, even with the best of intentions, of, of solving those problems in a way that won't make them worse? And actually what seems to happen across the board, uh, and again, I don't think it's for, generally it's not for the lack of good intentions, it's just that you can't do the job you don't have the information, you don't have the knowledge, that in every single, every single time where the state seeks to improve upon the market outcome, it makes it worse. So you do a comparative exercise, you say, well, which institution is better <laughs> at addressing problems and coming up with solutions uh, and allowing new ideas to deal with things and to make them better, it seems to be the market. It's got certain features that the state doesn't have, and the state have, uh, and so even if you accept, uh, and in a sense you have to, that there is such a thing as macroeconomics in the sense that it's part of markets go wrong, and people make mistakes, blah blah blah, there will be friction, blah blah blah. What is there to make you think that the state can do a better job uh, than the market? Because it's motivated by. Genuine concern, disinterested benevolence, unlike greed. Greed. Did I say greed? Greed. <laughs> Plenty of it. This has become as bone bonkers as, as that. It's, it's a silly thing to say. They are greedy, and that's the problem. No, no. But but you're right. You're right. That. It, if there's market failure, then well, who else is there? there has to be, it's got to be the government that, that steps in to solve it for you.
Yes, and of course, the more it screws things up, the more it shows a need for itself. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm. Joe? You mentioned that with digital currency, I think, mm -hmm. the, uh, you only need to transfer title and nothing needs to move. Um, but uh, I have a friend who owns a sort of bank full of gold in the Cayman Islands, and he actually owns the bank. And uh, it's stuffed full of gold. That's all they keep there. And uh, he said, he said, you obviously have to have good security. But um, surprisingly, little gold comes in or goes out. Just you just change the electronic yeah. ledger on who owns it. And if that gold were made into a currency, as it could be very very easily, it would be our currency. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, there could be a run on the bank, that's fine, you know, that they, they factor that into their calculations. Uh, they issue notes that were, as they were in this country, genuinely promised to pay the bearer in demand. And are in a position to do it. Yeah, and, and <laughs> they said, fine, you know, within a week or whatever, we'll, 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 we'll pay you locally and we'll reimburse them and whatever. In fact, they might not even need to. Uh, as long as the people who were reimbursing them locally were quite happy to receive the currency instead of the gold, all the gold would stay exactly where it was. As long as you trust them. Uh, whether there is any gold in Fort Knox at all, I don't know. Well, that was a strange thing. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there's some. Neither would I be surprised if it's not quite as much as they say. But apparently a week or so ago, the seals are broken because it hasn't been looked into for some years. And there was an audit, and someone wrote down the number, <laughs> and they came out again and put new seals on it, I think. But um, at the president's, <laughs> president's request, I believe. But, uh, but it's certainly true to say, what well, I've said in another talk, that you could have all the gold in one place and uh, you know, numbered <laughs> separately, or just regarded as a mass that could be separated out if it need be. And the whole thing could fall down a crack in, because of an earthquake. But then all you do is just carry on with the records that you had the day before. That, you know, he owns this, he owns this, he owns this, he owns this, and then it, you swap ownerships. So in a sense, it's a kind of Bitcoin without any coins, which is like, which is what Bitcoin is, of course. Yeah. yeah. The problem with Bitcoin is, I mean, gold has a real technological and jewellery and other uses, yeah. and which is, means that it could not fall below a certain value because it has real use value. Bitcoin. I'm more than happy for there to be gold as a, yeah. you know, all prices set in milligrams of gold. That's all. You don't have to carry it about. It just, but, you know, if you really want it, you, you can get it. It will, be, it will be done. That would be a far better way of... Well. Yes, sir. Well, I don't think you answered the gentleman's uh, question for me here, when he said markets are not perfect. And uh, because of that, the state has to intervene. Who else is going to be instead of the state? Now, I know you said about greed, and you found it a bit comical, and what have you. But look, greed is not going to build a sewer system, is it? Oh, uh, well, I think those are... <laughs> <laughs> It'll certainly fill it with... <laughs> It'll certainly fill the sewer system. Um, <laughs> But I think it also built it too. I mean, they were commercial enterprises, uh, the sewer systems. In, um, oh, in, in parts of London, there would be one water supply going up one side of the street and another different water supply going up the other side of the street. Indeed, that's how Jon Snow, not the, not the bowler, the found out, you know, the, the physician, found out that the water was contaminated on one side of the street. It's good. Was it cholera? No, 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 no. I believe at the time, these were private water companies. They laid down the mains. They connected to the houses. It might be that you, you need a, a, another system to look at how, uh, uh, you, how you can inter, intervene in the economy fiscally without taxation. Well, they do that. They, they certainly do that. It's called credit expansion. It's called borrowing from people who didn't save. It's called distorting the market. Yeah, well. They call it creating demand, 
So I think the Austrian insight is that they just shift demand. Well, in the end, make demand more diffuse. If there's inflation, you're reducing someone else's demand at the same time as you're increasing your own. So, That's right, yeah. You but for a, for a while, until the prices go up, which is why I've, I quite did that, that far too quick resume of the Austrian business cycle theory, in monetary terms, meaning that because of the money, and only because of the uh, credit expansion, which you can just print the money, they don't usually bother, but they, you could just print it, uh, then interest rates can be low. And for a while, capitalists can spend as if savings had increased. But when prices eventually start to adjust to this flood of, of money, then it, it's found out that you've um, we've started projects you should not have started. Well, it's found that the savings hasn't increased. Well, that's it. And, 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 and demand hasn't yeah. increased either. Real savings haven't, yes. And demand hasn't increased either. And even Hayek seems to fall for this idea that the stimulus must increase demand. But I think that's a slight mistake. I think the, what, if, I, if I'm given money, I can then use it to demand, but that will distort demand rather than increasing demand. It won't boost demand as Keynes held it would. It would. But is there anyone else? We're there. Are you all? You all yes, has, has Bob shut you all up? Have you all suffered enough? Is there, there's no one else to speak. <laughs> Oh, well, we better carry on in the bar then. Yes, I thought there was one more, yeah. No, I don't know. Well, 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 is not a desirable, desirable person and stops from possibly entering another country where they're not wanted. Uh, okay, it depends how large these areas are. Might be a country, might be a county, could just be a town. But there is a way of trapping people, the undesirable people. If there is no such thing as a border or passport or identification, then people could wander at will. Yes. Well, I, th I think the libertarian position would be rather, as you said at the end there, that there could be private towns, private counties, private cities, and you would have to, in one sense, either be unobjectionable or prove that you're unobjectionable or move on to the next town. I don't mind that. Uh, this freedom of movement thing, I think most libertarians would say you have a complete freedom of movement with the owner's permission, you know, onto that land of which you're going to move. Uh, flying through the air, not quite so much. But certainly moving from, from one piece of land to another. Now, very often it wouldn't be asked, or it's in their commercial interest to allow people in, and they're going to go home afterwards. But if, it, if it's to come there and live there, perhaps. Um, I'm all for that. Though of course, you have, to, you have to get the permission of those you're, whose land you're going to be treading upon. The point, the most, I don't know, how can I put that? The point being that you don't become an instant welfare right claiming citizen. You're just another bod who's turned up and you're assumed to be bona fide until you misbehave. Or there are things known about you that can be passed on from other places to say, you know, watch this chap, he's a wrong. He's a wrong. But the point is, it's the welfare right idea that annoys a lot of people. It may be the religion stuff as well. There might be other reasons to regret a uh, change in the population that you live amongst, of course. Uh, you, know, you, have, you have every right to not like it. You might have much right to do anything about it, but you have the right not to like it. But it's certainly true to say that you shouldn't just turn up and get welfare rights. Um, because the, the idea was that I've paid my way, I've put my stamps in my book, I, I deserve this, and now you just deserve it because you're in need. Well, <laughs> OK, but... Um, you're going to be needy then, aren't you? Because unless you can find a charitable organisation to look after you. So that's what's annoying a lot of people about freedom of movement. And there's a religious question as well. But it's mostly the idea that people just turn up. And, and it used to be the only way it could be got in, the welfare state schemes of various sorts, from Lloyd George onwards, was by saying it was contribution. It was contributory. You, you paid your, I've paid my stamp. I remember stamps being even new one. 
most people here. I remember stamps, you'd put a stamp in your national insurance book or something like that. I mean, you did it once or twice. Um, <laughs> well, then it became automatic or something, whatever. But uh, that was the idea that, you know, I've paid, I've made my contributions and I, yeah. Uh, but now it's just, you're in need. You're here, you're in need. NHS, Council House, whatever. No, I don't know how much of this is true. I believe it is true that you, you can pretty much get all of that stuff if you're simply over here and in need. Now, of course, if it, if, if the whole thing came of America, of, with a bit of help in Great Britain, bombing people to buggery in the Middle East, if that's the reason they're over here, well, it's, all, it's almost serve you right, but it's not serving the government, that they don't suffer so much from it. So that, but you're quite right. There would be, uh, you know, self-contained units that you'd have to, you know, you'd have to um, ask permission or behave in a certain way, or you had no right to remain, perhaps more than a week or whatever it might be. There's all sorts of local, you know, local towns and cities could have their own rules on these matters. It might be a wonderful thing if they did. Could you expand on the universal basic income oh. as an abomination? I'm a giddy. Oh. Uh, well, some, some of the Georgists and others thought something like that because the, liberal, the Liberals... And George was in the 19th century, wasn't he? Yeah. So they, the, the, they thought, especially, especially landowners raking in all this stuff, just as they owned a bit of what used to be a cow pasture in Mayfair or something, and now they're getting these huge rents rolling in. Is that fair? Well, doesn't do any harm. Are they, are they a thousand times happier than you because they have a thousand times your income? Are they at all happier than you? I mean, well, perhaps the best things in life are pretty cheap. They are. Friends, well, yeah, companies. Sex no. and sleep make you happy. Well, it does. <laughs> I, I, I find it difficult to combine sex and sleep. Yeah, you need a nice bed to sleep in, don't you? <laughs> and comfortable surroundings. And you have to buy, you have to buy wine beforehand. That's what you might do. Something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you going to serenade your amma mater as well? Um, wine is unnecessary. But I can't see how you can get those things without wealth. That was my point. Oh, I see. <laughs> is there anyone else who wants to speak? Oh, well, I warmed up eventually. Well, universal basic income is a big thing with the, uh, the bleeders, as I call them, bleeding heart libertarians. Oh, the, the, uh, they think this is wonderful way forward. It is being tried here and there around the world. Um, the, uh, Do you have to call it? The, 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 the defense seems to be you know, based on moral luck. Uh, uh, oh, idea. Yeah. Just unfortunate that you're at the bottom of the pile and you did nothing to deserve to be at the bottom of the pile. And, uh, yeah, and therefore, we guarantee this anyway. And um, uh, the, the moral luck uh, idea is uh, sort of re seems to be related to Rawls' idea that nobody should be able to benefit from the proceeds of social cooperation, which doesn't exist. There's no such thing as social cooperation. Individuals cooperate. Society is not a whole, the organisation of it. But anyway, nobody should benefit from it unless it makes the worst, the, the worst off better off, which I recently saw a very good video by Thomas Zolz. Soul, I say. Soul, soul. He said, he said, this is the sort of the wino's veto. Uh, he's lying in the gutter, drinking his life away. No, you can't do that unless I get a cut. Goes, Why the hell should he get a cut? But this is what universal basic income is. However useless you are, however feckless and criminal and irresponsible. Besides, it wouldn't be universal. It would be. It would be national, or state, or regional, but it wouldn't be. It's, it seems like a cruel idea to have a, a universal basic income because if you're taking the same amount of benefits money, and that presumably has to be the assumption, which is you're not increasing the total amount of money being distributed, you're just distributing it in a different way, oh, to those then, then the result is that it's, 
that at the moment there's a sort of idea, well, if you're really sort of, if you're disabled and you happen to have the ill luck, so lots of children and so on and so forth, then you get more. And if you don't need it because you earn a lot of money and so on, then, then you don't get anything. Whereas presumably with the universal basic income, you get the same. Now that same, therefore, means that the people who might be said to really, really need it will get much, much less because there's money being given to people like me who don't need it. So it seems to be a completely cruel and stupid idea. <laughs> unless, unless actually what's being said is, oh, no, 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 no. We're actually going to give far more in total money so that at the moment, if there's a 300 billion being given out with the, with the universal basic income system, we'll distribute 10 times as much so that everybody gets a really high amount. But then we're not arguing about how it's distributed. We're arguing about how much should be taken from producers in taxes and given out as benefits, which is, which is a completely different debate. But if you hold the amount the same, then it seems to me to be cruel and stupid. I mean, not that I think our present system is a particularly good one, but it's got to be better, you might have said. Well, apart so you give a bit more to the people who can't walk and a bit less to people like me than to give the same to everybody. Well, apart from that, those who are earning next to nothing can't contribute much to this. Therefore, those that are earning a lot would have to contribute a lot. It's stupid. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I don't need it. I want the money. I mean, I'll have it. You know, give it to me. Great. I want his share. No, the whole structure, <laughs> structure is based on £100 a week to everybody. Uh, £5,000 a year, roughly. Um, now, to those who already have, because they are earning, they will be taxed and they will lose it. Uh, for those who aren't earning enough, they won't be taxed, so they'll keep it. Uh, you get rid of all the administration. Well, all, all the bodies, all the accounts. Have I think they'll find other uses for them. Yeah, yeah, you might, might find it, but the civil servants can be reduced. Uh, strongly. But, but you, you don't get rid of all of it, because if you give a disabled person who really can't work for himself just five grand a year, that person would be really, really bad, badly off. So there would be immediately calls for people to, well, we need the basic income, plus we need the NHS, and we need uh, support for, for the really poor. So then you're talking about basic income on top of the welfare state as we have it already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, what, that's what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> Pat? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a great opponent of what's called Nordic socialism, you know, so birds. I do think that the basic income idea it, it is a good idea, provided it's tied in with what you mentioned earlier, Bob, about stamps and oh. being rewarded what you've put into society and that kind of thing. Well, you, this, um, but then you I, might. I would say yeah. if, 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 it's, if it's expanded, well, to, you, you can expand it to everybody. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a gentleman the just said, the if, you're, if you're getting back what you put in, you might as well have not put in. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the thing is, uh, you know, and, and Rousseau was talking about the social contract. The thing is, when you've got somebody, you've taken away their land so they can't grow anything. They haven't got a house. Uh, they can't live anywhere. You've taken away everything from them. Who's you? I deny it. Who is this person? You, you, but, uh, an imaginary person living in a city. You, you, you must have some kind of contract with them to stop them from rioting, from damaging, because they haven't got anything. There is, there is a contract. Yeah, I, I agree with Rousseau's social contract on that principle, but not to everybody. I mean, just to give you a simple example, the, the libertarian idea of open borders is absolutely insane. Well, it's also no, closed board. It's if also I, closed borders. If I could just I was with a group of Russian people recently, and they said to me, "Do you know what? Laughing with a wig, incidentally, all these uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and God knows what, coming from the Middle East." He said, "They said, I don't know why they go along this long route to get to Europe. I mean, Russia's a lot nearer. Why don't they go there?" And of course, they would all laugh. Well, we know why they don't go there. If you don't know, you, I mean, you shouldn't be here. But I, I think there's no explanation from me. But once you start giving these, all these social benefits to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that turns up with his four wives and 20 spots, uh, you know, with each one costing a quarter of a million, uh, uh, a quarter of a million pounds to, to, to take from childhood to, to a school leaver age, 
I mean, it's absolutely insane to do that with a tax for the taxpayer to face that. That's why when you mention stamps, uh, you know that, that you have some given some contribution to society, and I remember the old stamp. Oh, society is, is by producing, not by yeah, not well, by paying a tax. That's well, that's not that's not contributing to society. Well, it we contribute not when we spend. We contribute not when we pay tax, but when we make some bloody thing or provide a service. That's our that's true contribution. Mean, yeah, that's what I was making. That's what I mean in particular that you, you that you were engaged in society, that you were involved in that particular country, whatever it was, whether it's a European Union or anything. But you have to have some involvement to get, you know to get the reward. Otherwise. Uh, a lib it, it yeah. simply won't work. A libertarian city, you would have thought, were people who have either saved or they're in some insurance scheme. Uh, they wouldn't expect these things to be provided by um, the authorities. All the authorities provide is what, law or order, grass clipping, I don't know. N not a lot. Um, yes, you... There isn't a problem to have it's to solve. Well, company company. indeed, company. companies can do all sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, uh, David? The question is not borders. The question is, who should be deciding who gets to cross them? That's the question. And at the moment, we have a system where um, the government decides who gets to cross the one border in the one place, and it does that job extremely badly. Whereas what we really want, and um, uh, how you get there is a different question, is, 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 is that decision is made ultimately by individuals, by individuals, by property owners, by businesses, Etc. 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 And that I think would give much better, uh, more sensible, and less cruel results than the system which we have now, which just seems to be arbitrary and stupid. It stops. It stops the people that we would want to come into the country coming in, and it seems to let in the quite often people that we don't want. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a stupid, bad system. So it's not should there be people. It's it's, it, it's who should be making the decisions, uh, and where should those borders be? I mean. Why is there just one border? Uh, here, here. I just I have to say on that. Well, uh, is there any more questions? No. Well, shall we continue eating the bar then? We shall. Yeah. So, 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 thank you very much.